Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I thank all of you for coming today evening. And I'll try to speak today on the topic of how the mind distorts our conception of life. We need to focus on life, not on the commentary that the mind is offering about life. So this I'll speak based on 6.5 and 6.6 .6 in the Bhagavad Gita. 6.5 is Uddhare Dhatmanatmanam Natmanam Avasadayet Atmaivayatmano Bandhur Atmaiva Ripuratmanaha So Krishna says we should elevate ourselves with our mind and we should not degrade ourselves. What this means is he is saying that the mind is there inside us and it is going to work in different ways. And we have to choose so that it works for us and not against us. A few months ago, I was at a mental health care center in New Jersey. I gave a talk for the counselors or the mental health care providers. And after that, I was talking with them about different kinds of mental health problems that people have. What are the common problems and how do they manifest? How are they treated? We are having a discussion. So, some people sometimes hear a voice inside their head and when they keep hearing that voice again and again and again, then they may go to a doctor and you know, I am hearing this voice inside my head, what is this voice actually? So, sometimes hearing a voice inside the head is considered to be a mental health disorder. Now, as I was hearing this doctor speak, I thought that Actually, we all hear a voice inside our head, isn't it? <laughs> so, so I was uh, basically, uh, we all hear different things at different times, which sometimes distort us from the way we are meant to function. I remember the first time, maybe 25, 30 years ago, I gave a talk in public. It was before I was introduced to Bhakti. There is a college. Uh, it was a college, re uh, it was a audition for an elocution competition to represent the college. And I was speaking and I had so much to speak, it was a 7 minute audition which I had to do. And I started speaking, I was so excited, one of my, one of my conditionings is that I speak very fast. In fact, when I was recently in LA, one senior devotee, I went and met him. He attended one of some of my classes. He told me at that time that, you know, I'll, give, I'll tell you, I'll give you a gift that will help you very much. I said, okay. Yes. So I went to meet him in his room and he gave me a card. And in that card he had to be, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> he said, keep this card in front of you always. <laughs> that is my gift to you. So I have this tendency that I speak very fast. I tend to think fast and speak fast. So at that time I started, I, I was supposed to start my elocution and I just started speaking. Sometimes if you get into a car and as soon as you get in the car, the person shoots off. Then you just get jerked back. You know, before you can tie the seat belt or you can move, and the car is shooting off. So like that, I started off and I spoke for about 30 seconds, 45 seconds and I could see nobody was connecting. Sometimes you can, actually you can make out whether people are hearing or not. And somehow something inside me told me that actually in order to catch their interest, you should speak faster. <laughs> <laughs> and I started speaking faster. And still nobody was paying attention. People were looking at the watch, looking at the door. I started speaking faster. And then I had prepared for a seven minute talk and a two and a half minute was over. <laughs> so then after that, I asked, I asked the, those who were taking the audition, okay, so how was it? He said, you know, we didn't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> so then I had recorded the audio and then I replayed it and I found that the last one minute, even I couldn't understand what I was speaking. <laughs> it's a zooming past. <laughs> so that is one of the striking memories for me of, of something inside me completely misreading the situation. Mm -hmm. The problem was I was speaking too fast, but the voice inside said, speak faster. 
So the very cause of the problem was aggravated. So like that, we all have had situations when something inside us told us to do something and it simply made things worse. How many of you have had any similar experience? You don't have to share it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So when we hear something, this voice inside the head, it sometimes gives us good ideas also. It's not that it's always bad, but there is something inside us. And what exactly is that? And how does it work? So basically the Bhagavad Gita explains that our existence is the three levels, the body, the mind and the soul. These are like if you have a computer system, the hardware, the software and the user. So the software is something which is meant to help us better access the hardware. But if the software is malfunctioning, say if I am working on a computer and sometimes there are some auto-completes. If I write a particular word and it completes it auto it auto corrects it if I type a spelling wrong but suppose I am writing a word document and suddenly some other pop-up window comes up and you know okay some notification has come on Facebook some news breaking news has come this has happened that has happened then it will catch our attention and if you pay attention it will go there now normally most uh, notifications come as pop-up windows but sometimes, say some people are visually impaired, then they may uh, have the notifications coming as voices. You know, a new email has arrived. Or, so the voice speaks out. And now the text-to-speech software are also quite good. which you can read out fairly well. So when this voice comes up, say we are doing one thing and suddenly this voice starts off. And when the voice starts off, on the computer, you can decide, okay, do I need to pay attention to this now? Or can I do it later? So to the extent we are purposeful, to the extent we are focused, we are doing something important, say, okay, I will pay attention to this later. But if we are just reading something casually, we may say, okay, mm, I can look at that later. I can read, I can do this work later. Let me look at it right now. So similarly, our mind is like the software. The body is the hardware, the soul is the user. And the mind keeps giving us many notifications. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. We are capable of being aware of many things. Say, if we are driving a car, then our focus is on the road ahead. But then we also have part of our vision which is looking front, uh, way ahead. And if we see a stream of a series of cars there are crowding together, then we understand I have to press the brake right now. Or we will be looking at the road, but at the same time, we are aware of the signals. Okay, uh, the, okay here there is a school area, here there is a residential area, whatever. So we are capable of having some awareness in the foreground, while also having some awareness in the background. Say right now you are sitting here, you are hearing this talk. So you are aware of what is going on in the talk, but at the same time you may be aware, okay, this room is, is it too hot, is it too cold? Normally, if there is, no, there is no extreme stimulus coming up from the background, we don't focus on it. Say, if it just becomes too crowded and starts becoming hot, then we may feel it. Or it starts becoming chilly, then we may feel it. If in the periphery of our awareness, the stimuli are not above or below the threshold of normal, then we don't pay attention to it. So right now, all of us are uh, discussing this. Uh, this class, you know, now you may hear the steps of somebody coming up. Now if it's a, no, a people coming up the steps, it's a normal sound. So we may, we note it, but we don't focus on it. But suppose right now, we hear somebody suddenly screaming. And everybody will turn around, what happened? And because that sound is out of the ordinary. So this, capacity to be aware of something in the foreground or to focus on something in the foreground while also being aware of things in the background. This is important for us 
because in life events can happen in many different directions uh, so just as in the, while we are driving a car somebody may just try to race ahead of us from the right side or somebody may just come into our lane so many things can go wrong so we have capacity for being aware of many things it's not that we are simultaneously aware of many things our mind works very fast for a moment it takes note of this thing and it comes back it takes note of that and comes back so then it doesn't give too much time okay i see i see the person coming over there on that lane and the person is say jerking too much i mean is this person drunk maybe i'll just move on to the other lane so if we see them driving normally is noted and we don't focus on it so our normal functioning of the mind now all this i am giving in terms of visuals but the same we can apply in terms of audio also say if we are here uh, if say we are hearing a lecture on our phone and at time the phone gives audio notification a email has arrived from so and so now if that if we are expecting something and that urgent that is urgent then we will shift or okay an email has come that's a good notification i'll look at it later <coughs> so basically the in the inside us there is there are multiple inputs that are coming in and we need to be able to process and focus on that which is the most important or in this particular situation that which is the most urgent and the other inputs we can put them aside maybe some of you can come ahead because there are many devotees coming still yes. thank you so when we focus on something which is for us important then we can act effectively but suppose say, some unwanted notification just comes up and starts distorting us say sometimes a notifications come in a computer some notification comes and you you don't find anywhere to cross to to remove it only it's just there and then we may have to just filling the screen just catch hold of it and just move it aside we can't minimize it but we can just move it aside at that so similarly for us inside our mind many voices are there so basically the voice i'm using as a metaphor because the inputs can come from the eyes they can come the as a touch if we something warm or cold it can come from smell they can from all the five senses in, inputs come and the bhagavad gita says in 15.8 that the mind is the integrator of the inputs from the five senses shotram chakshu sparshanam cha rasanam ghranam eva cha adhishthaya manashchayam vishayan upasevate so shotram chakshu ho the eyes the ears the nose the tongue and the skin from these the inputs come to the mind and the mind presents it to the soul so you could say the mind is like the screen on which the inputs are coming in so sometimes these inputs start becoming so insistent that we just get distorted we just get distracted so sometimes when we are inter- uh, when say somebody has hurt us so somebody has spoken something which has really hurt us then after that we may be a little fragile we may be a little sens- hypersensitive then if anybody else also speaks a little bit negative we might we might feel very offended by that it is not that what they spoke was offensive but we are vulnerable at that time so for example say normally if we pat someone on the back or just touch them no this is a it's just, just a it's just a gesture of greeting but say if they have some wound on their hand, shoulder and i pat them ah, 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 it causes a much greater reaction because there is already a wound over there so similarly for us the mind is inside us and the mind sometimes uh, accentuates or aggravates certain stimuli so if one person has spoken harshly to me the mind starts saying people are so bad nobody cares for you nobody loves you nobody respects you and then second person does like that then just see what i said was right and then if a third person does like that and the mind says yes see nobody cares for you 
and now and the fourth person maybe just a small neglect on their part say we are walking through a door and they are in front of us and instead of just holding the door open they just let it loose let it close and we may just explode how rude you are and now they may just be lost in their thoughts and they not even notice that we are behind them so what happens the mind can uh, sometimes it interprets a particular thing in a particular way and after it's in, it started telling one story you know people don't care for you and then everything that is happening it starts interpreting it in a way that it acts as evidence for that story so if i start believing that say as i said people don't care for me then one ev- one event second event third event even if there are people who are ca- there are pe- there are other ways in which people care for me i will just the mind will silence that the mind will not allow me to focus on that so one of my friends is a is a mental health care provider so one of his services was to act as a uh, as a suicide helpline attendant so when people commit suicide just when the thought is coming you know kill yourself kill yourself kill yourself at that time if somehow they can talk with someone they hear a human voice and that human voice speaks something to deter them then they they may be saved and he he saved several people that way so it's 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 literally the mind is something which can kill the body suicide is when the mind kills the body yes problems are there out there but the mind interprets them you know this is wrong that is wrong that is wrong everything is wrong what is the use of living so suicide is when the voice inside us tells us to kill ourselves and at that time if you can just hear some other voice hey you know you don't have to do this so then that if that voice can be countered at that time or that voice can be interrupted at that time then even lives can be saved so he was telling me that uh, <coughs> there's one girl who committed suicide and then called it was you know, she took the heavy heavy dosage and then she called so then they rushed to there to rescue her and why did she take those pills this she was in a relationship with some boy and she called that boy and that boy didn't pick up her phone <laughs> that's it, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> because of that she thought oh he doesn't love me maybe he's with someone else he doesn't care for me you know maybe you know in future also no one will care for me all my friends will be in happy relationships i'll be all alone everybody will feel pity for me like my life will be so miserable what is the use of living such a life let me commit suicide so you now somebody not picking up a phone call is such a trivial thing in a sense now there could be 100 reasons why somebody may not pick up a phone call but the event is just one event but the mind gives a spin to that event now what the voice inside the head is telling whom is something which we just don't know everybody has this voice inside their head and it is interpreting reality in a particular way so as this voice keeps speaking keeps speaking keeps speaking then uh, whatever events are happening see, see the mind is the mind is actually playing multiple roles the mind is not just an interpreter of reality in the sense that it is say it is like this is like this this is like this this is like this but the mind is also filtering reality filtering means it does not allow us to see certain things say at one recently a few uh, in the in my last us trip i was just driving from one place to another one devotee was driving me and something had happened in the india which had just disturbed me very much and we were going through california uh, going from one place to another and i was just so disturbed i was thinking what to do how to respond to it and then it just went on for a we were, we started from the city we started went from la we're going to carpentaria and as we were going going you know i was just lost in my thoughts and then suddenly i looked and i saw this such a beautiful mountain this beautiful sky beautiful mountain there was a there's a sea which we could see this was such a spectacular sight i just then asked the devotee who was driving me he says when did this start 
He says, it's 25 minutes. <laughs> so I was just so lost in my thoughts that I just didn't notice it at all. So what happens here? It's the, the voice inside us not only gives us a particular story, but it also blinds us to other things. So it starts filtering the reality. We get lost in our head. And when we are lost in our head, then you just don't see what is happening. And sometimes this happens the most when we are chanting. <laughs> because why? Actually the chanting is meant to control the mind. I'll talk more about how bhakti helps in dealing with this voice inside the mind. But unfortunately what happens? Say, sometimes our mind seems to wander the most when we are chanting. That is, that is for a particular reason. See, basically, the soul is here, the mind is here, and the body is here. In the body, the tongue is there. So, when we are chanting the holy names, actually, we are not chanting. It is the tongue that is chanting. The tongue is chanting the holy names. The mind is wandering, and the soul is thinking, which of the two to do? <laughs> So most of the time what happens, the tongue goes on an auto-chant mode <laughs> and the soul starts wandering with the mind. <laughs> so normally, normally when we are doing something which requires physical attention, say if you are driving a car through a crowded place, at that time we need to be physically attentive otherwise there can be an accident. So at that time, even if this voice inside the head is saying something, the mind is wandering here and there, we neglect it. We focus. Yes. But say if you are driving through a long, clear road with not much traffic, not much to negotiate, then what happens? The mind starts wandering. When the physical reality does not require immediate attention, then we tend to go off at the mental level. So now, during chanting, we are meant to go to the spiritual level. The sound of the holy name can help us rise to the spiritual level. But unfortunately, uh, the sound can seem sometimes very repetitious and it may not seem very interesting. It's like when we are driving through a clear road, it may not seem very interesting. So, when chant chanting the holy name doesn't seem very interesting. On the other hand, the story that the mind is telling us, it seems much more interesting. So, just like sometimes we drive to a place, sometimes we are lost in our thoughts, we may get into our car, start from our home, go to office, and we reach office also, and then, you know, how did I drive here? So caught in our thoughts, we don't even realize. We somehow, on an auto mode, we went along, because it's a predicted road, it's a well-known road, and there is not much disruption over this. We just took the right turns and got there. So, sometimes working on the auto mode also works. It's not necessarily a problem. But, when it is chanting, we want to focus on the holy name. So the holy name is a sound which, can, which, in, which comes from the physical level. We chant with our tongue, but that sound, if we pay attention to it, it will take us to the spiritual level. But when we don't pay attention to it, it just the sound comes at the physical level and stays at the physical level. Our consciousness doesn't get invested in it. So when, uh, when during chanting, we don't feel that there is any immediate consequence of inattentive chanting. It's like inattentive driving can have a serious consequence. But inattentive chanting, it also has consequence. But it doesn't seem serious in an immediate way. So therefore, when the mind starts telling its story, we just go off with the mind. So it is not that the mind wanders more during chanting. It is just that we don't feel that the physical level requires more attention much attention and that's why we go off with the mind and the mind works in such a way that the more attention we pay to that voice the louder it becomes say if if same situation you know that say if i feel people don't care for me now when i when the voice is you know says see they like they forgot this they don't care for you now if i if at that time I have something important to do. Let's say I have an important meeting to attend, I have an exam to give, I have some important assignment to complete. Then, although that voice is there, I will not pay attention to it. But if I don't have much to do, especially in much that does not require my focused attention, 
then that voice will be there and the voice will keep speaking and the more I pay attention to it the voice starts growing it starts growing bigger and bigger and bigger so the it's like a, sometimes we have children and some ch children start making faces you know like all kind of faces they make and they start making those faces now if the parents pay some attention it's entertaining the child starts making more faces more gestures so, so we have a child making that already <laughs> so similarly if we pay attention to the mind the voice that it is speaking it just grows bigger and bigger and bigger and then it can consume our consciousness completely so this voice inside us can be actually very dangerous and the way to deal with this voice is twofold before we go into the solution part let me uh, add a few points as i said earlier that this the mind doesn't just transmit a voice but it also distorts our vision it is not only an interpreter of reality it is also a distorter of reality say if uh, any time the cricket matches are going on or any sports matches are going on there's a commentary which goes on with it <coughs> now when the commentary is going on at that time the purpose of the commentary is to help the spectators understand the match better and enjoy the match better okay this match is going on like this and in this situation you know there was this match like this and this happened at that time let us see what happens here so the commentary of the cricket match say is meant to increase the enjoyment increase the absorption increase the involvement in the match there are the event which you can see with the eyes but then there is a voice that tells okay this is like this, this is like this this is the situation now now imagine that so normally there is the there is the cricketers who are on the sports on the sports field there is a commentator who is by the side somewhere in the commentator's box and there are spectators who are there all over the world and the commentary is meant for the spectators but suppose the commentary is heard by the players also so the batsman is batting and while the batsman is batting the commentator is commentator is, commentator is also coming in the ear is hearing it with some high tech devices there they can hear it and say the match is at a critical turn and one batsman is batting very well and he is he can take the match to victory but the commentator says actually you know this match is already lost <laughs> now this batsman is the last hope once he gets out everybody is going to collapse like a pile of cards and this batsman is batting very well you know he's hitting boundaries he is he's hitting sixes scoring very well and the commentator says that was just a lucky shot you know soon his luck is going to run out how long is luck going to stay now actual reality is that the batsman is leading the match to victory but the commentator is saying no you're going to lose you're going to lose you're going to lose now oh, here the reality is one thing and the commentary instead of enhancing the reality is trying to distort the reality is misshape the reality so similarly for us the mind is a commentator but in our life we are not just the spectators we are the players and as the player it is for us to act responsibly it is for us to act competently but the mind keeps giving its commentary no, this is not going to work out say we go for book distribution for the first time and nobody is going to take books nobody is going to take books nobody going to listen to you nobody cares for you and if somebody somebody takes a book also that was just lucky you know it's not going to happen again so the mind keeps speaking various things and in that way the mind comes between us and reality i am here the reality is here the mind the mind is meant to be the presenter of reality but instead of simply being a presenter it becomes a interpreter and a distorter of reality it interprets see, this is like this, this is like this, this is like this but the, and its interpretation is distorting so most of the times when uh, we get mentally distressed the primary reason for this is the mind is distorting our perception of reality the reality may be bad also it's bad things do happen in life but the mind often aggravates 
the whatever bad is there say if somebody has insulted us now the insult happens in one moment and yes it is painful but suppose say if um, suppose say if sometimes you know we are uh, getting we are going through some door or just right say in an airport if you are sitting on a seat and you rise up you suddenly rise up and if you are very tall our head may bump against the upper wall now if the head bumps against the wall hey, we'll move our head away now do you think there will be anyone who will again hit the wall hit once second time again third time fourth time now if you are hurt once then you will avoid that stimulus we want to replay the hurt again physical level but actually at the emotional level we keep replaying the hurt that means one person has insulted me yes that that's hurting me but the mind keeps replaying it oh this bowl is that to you oh he must have seen it she must have seen it what they must have said about you so not only the insult the minds are saying you fool why didn't you have a good comeback at that time this book like that you should have spoken like that and it's a replay that just goes on and on and on and hurts at the emotional level are also real it's not that the my mental level is just some abstract or conceptual it is also there's real effects on us so normally at a physical level we will never re- repeat the hurt will be careful to avoid it but at the mental level when one bad thing happens the mind keeps replaying it replaying it replaying it and by replaying it it aggravates the hurt normally at a physical level will replay something which is if it is enjoyable say, uh, say maybe 7 8 years ago india won the cricket world cup so at that time the indian cricket captain hit a match winning sixer so that's in cricket history that is the clip that has been replayed the most people just keep replaying it i'll just see how we won the world cup so normally if something is enjoyable we replay it but with respect to the mind it sometimes just replays that which is just distressing now why does it do like this so krishna says this is determination in the mode of ignorance ya swapnam bhayam shokam विषादम मदमे न विमुंचति दुर्मेधा धृती सा पार्थ तामसी 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 मीन्स इन द मोड ऑफ इग्नोरेंस सो धृती मीन्स डिटर्मिनेशन सो नॉर्मली वी कंसिडर डिटर्मिनेशन एज समथिंग वेरी पॉजिटिव सो टू होल्ड ऑन टू समथिंग इवन वेन देर इज डिफिकल्टी दैट इज कॉल्ड डिटर्मिनेशन बट इफ आई होल्ड ऑन टू समथिंग वर्थ वाइल दैट इज गुड इफ आई एम फॉलोइंग डाउन फ्रॉम अ क्लिफ and somebody throws a rope and i catch hold of the rope now even if there are blisters on my hand and my hand is bleeding should i hold on to it because it's a matter of life or death for me so holding on amidst difficulty to something which is important is determination but suppose i am sitting comfortably in my house and i hold on to some sharp object which is causing tears to my head is causing me bleeding holding on to that is stupidity so determination in the mode of ignorance is the perverse of determination it leads to our holding on to things which are unwanted which are unhealthy our holding on to things which actually hurt us so this happens at the mental level when we keep replaying again and again the things that have gone wrong so krishna says asapnam bhayam shokam bhaya means fear shoka means lamentation so broadly speaking if you see there are two major categories of mental health problems that people have one is anxiety now anxiety started shooting up or at least people the experience of anxiety started shooting up since the 1960s but now uh, another mental health problem which is which has now become a close competitor sometimes like superseded anxiety is depression so now if we consider from this model of the voice speaking inside us what is the nature of anxiety and what is the nature of depression basically we are experiencing reality right now hmm? so physically things are in front of us and we are experiencing it but 
<coughs> when the mind starts replaying something that may go wrong in the future. This may go wrong, that may go wrong, that may go wrong, that may go wrong, that may go wrong. And as it keeps replaying it again and again and again, then that starts causing anxiety. So this may go wrong. And what happened? One, two, three, four, five. And in the mind goes inside. One, two, three, four, five. Thinking about the future in order to plan for it, to prepare for it is good. But in this case, when the mind starts replaying it, or the mind starts, as in, it's, the mind has both visual and audio. It speaks, look at that. Just see, this is going to go wrong. That is going to go wrong. This will go wrong. This will go wrong. So when it starts replaying like that, then we get anxiety. We get, ang we get a panic attack. We get completely overwhelmed. And then it can become a serious problem when you just become overwhelmed. Because at that particular time, the mind just is going crazy. We are looking at this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. Now right now, physically, actually nothing may be wrong. Physically, I may be perfectly calm. But it's just the mind, the voice inside that, this will go wrong, this will go wrong, this will go wrong. And thus we get overwhelmed by anxiety. It said that I write articles. I write articles on the Gita every day, GitaDaily.com. So one of the articles I wrote there was, you "Now worry is like the interest that we pay on loans we haven't yet taken. <laughs> it's a future problem which may not even happen, but it's an interest we are paying on a loan. Nobody would do it at physical level, but we do it at the mental level. So anxiety happens when the mind starts replaying worst case scenarios from the past, future." And conversely, depression happens when the mind starts replaying all the bad things that have happened to us. See, this person did like this. See, this went like this went wrong like that. You know, you yourself made this mistake over here. See, this went wrong. This went wrong. Now, in all our lives, things have gone wrong at times. But the very fact that we are alive means some things have gone right also. Mm. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be alive. Mm. Now, how many people die by the age of 20, 25, 30, 40. Mm. There are countries in the world, especially in Africa, where the average uh, average human age is less than 40. Mm. So, some kind, so basically the point is that actually there are many things which have gone wrong in our life and many things which have gone right also in our life. But when depression happens, the mind starts replaying, this went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong. And then it says, see, all these things went wrong in your life. And the future is going to be the more of the same only. And then we just get completely de-energized. Mm. Just get completely exhausted. Sometimes, you now we wake up in the morning fresh. But there is this voice that goes on, you know. See, this person did like this. See, this went wrong. And then within two, three hours, without having done much work, we feel tired. I can't do anything. So here, it is the mind that has drained our physical energy. Actually, the voice in the head, it has real effects on us. The effects are not just circumstantial or casual. That actually, real problems can happen to us if we do not learn to uh, manage this voice inside us. So, now, how do we go about managing this voice? Broadly speaking, there are three aspects to it. First is identifying the voice. If I don't even identify, this is, this is a voice inside me and this is speaking me, this, but I don't have to listen to it. This, is, this voice is different from me. If, I don't, if you don't even identify the mind, then there is no way of rectifying it. There is no way of minimizing its influence on it or preventing it from influencing us. So identifying the voice is the first step. We will talk uh, uh, later about how to go about doing this. But the first step is identifying it. The second step is focusing on something other than this voice. Actually, we can't silence the voice. It's always going to speak. But depending on how much attention we give to it, it will grow louder. 
if we don't give attention to it it will become softer so we need to have something worthwhile to focus on so first is identification second is engagement that we focus we engage ourselves on something constructive and then third is challenging the voice not challenging in the sense of combating the voice we don't want two voices to be fighting inside our head challenging means that this is not the only reality there is a different take to reality so we need to have some other source of knowledge inside us which gives us uh, we need to have some other source of knowledge accessible to us which helps us see that i am seeing reality is like this but actually it may not be like this it can be something different also and the more we learn to give credibility to this alternative source of knowledge the more we learn to hear that voice the more this voice will become softer in fact this is actually ultimately the voice of guru sadhu shastra the voice of scripture sages and spiritual master and the wonderful thing is if this voice we keep hearing it more and more not only does this voice start influencing us more but actually this voice changes the mind's voice also the mind will over a period of time become our friend the bhagavad gita says that that bandhur atma atmanastasya yenaatmai vaatmana jitha anaatmana su shatrutve varte taatmai va shatruvat that for those who have learned to control the mind the mind becomes their friend so it is possible for us to make the mind into our friend so i will today speak briefly on these three points but tomorrow's class will be elaborating these three points you know identify identify identifying engagement engaging ourselves and connecting with the alternative source of knowledge so the bhagavad gita in the 14th chapter tells us that we sh- it talks about three modes of material nature and there it says we should become a observer of our consciousness that various stimuli will come inside us just be a detached observer prakasham cha pravrittim cha moham eva cha pandava nadveshti sampravrittani na nivrittani kaankshati udasina vadasinam gunayo na vichayate guna vartanti tyeva yovati shrutati na engate in 14.22 to 23 it says that sometimes you'll just feel cheerful and clear prakasha sometimes you will feel passionate and pushed come on do this do this what are you doing with your life come on run here do this do that pravrutti sometimes moha what is the need to do anything just we become apathetic just don't feel like doing anything at all in hindi it is chalta hai then what is happening let it happen don't bother about it so the, all these different kinds of inputs will come into us when they come in krishna says just observe them they will come in they will go don't identify with them how can we not identify with them that is by the pract- by understanding that we are souls understanding that we are different from the uh, from the voice from the various thoughts that are coming inside us the various emotions that are coming inside us the various voices that are speaking inside us we are the soul we are different from that then later on this is 14.22 and 14.27 krishna says ultimately how do we go beyond all these these voices inside us they speak because of the three modes of material nature i'll talk about the modes more tomorrow also but he says the way to do that is ma by steady bhakti yoga by constant engagement in bhakti maam cha yogya vicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunan samati dhyaitan brahma bhuyaya kalpate he says that if we become purposefully engaged firmly engaged in the practice of bhakti that means this voice is speaking but no matter what the voice speaks i am going to serve krishna now serving krishna is not just chanting the holy names or uh worshiping the deities chanting serving krishna is the inclusive activity all our lives activities we can do in a mood of service to krishna so when we become engaged in this way in something that is valuable for us something that is more important for us see all of us have this voice inside us and all of us have the capacity to turn away from this voice like earlier i gave the example if i'm driving a car 
if there is a lot of traffic then even if his, my mind is showing something saying something we put it aside and we focus on what i'm doing just like say if i have an exam in one hour and my computer gives some notification hey there's this your friend has posted a picture okay later now the exam is after 6 months okay let me see what is the picture so now that means the notification may still come but it depends on us whether we respond to the notification or not same way we have the capacity to put the mind aside put the mind's word aside if we have something urgent and purposeful to do so that cultivating that purpose sense of purposefulness and engaging ourselves that krishna says is the way to transcend the modes and then in the same 13th chapter uh, in the previous chapter 13 chapter he says that ultimately how do you go beyond the illusion of this world by hearing anye tvayo majananta shutva anye bhyo pasate te pichati tarandeva mrityum shuti parayana this is beautiful word over the 13.26 he says shruti parayana that those who become attached to hearing the bhagavatam uses the word narayana parayana vasudeva parayana those who are devoted to narayana or vasudeva here krishna is using that yes we will become devoted to narayan but before that we have to become devoted to hearing hearing means he said we hear from scripture we hear from sadhus so when we hear this and we take the input from there then the result of hearing will be krishna says mrutyam atitaranti one will even go beyond the cycle of birth and death it is the mind and its propositions come on enjoy this enjoy this that keeps our consciousness consumed in the material level but when we learn to hear regularly we realize that there's a higher better richer reality and a higher better better richer life waiting for me in connection with that higher reality if i connect with krishna there's a better life for me and as we start connecting more and more with krishna then the mind itself gets transformed and over a period of time uh, the scriptural message gets internalized within us so even if we are not hearing the scripture externally still the replay of the scripture message goes on instead of the mind replaying unwanted stimuli actually it is the words of the sadhus the words of scripture that start replaying within us and that's the time when we become empowered empowered to not only counter the mind's influence on us but empowered to help others counter the mind's influence on them and that is when we become agents of positive change helping people helping people protect themselves from the distress caused by their minds and of course helping ourselves to minimize the distress that is caused by our mind ashila prabhupada was such a messenger you know he brought the voice of scripture far and wide all over the world it is he who has given us access to the knowledge of the bhagavad gita and by this knowledge we all if we understand and apply it properly we all can minimize uh, the aggravation of life's distress by the mind's commentary on that distress and thus we can move forward in our life journey with minimum agitation and ultimately to the best destination by shri prabhupada and krishna's grace so i'll summarize what i spoke and then we can have some questions i spoke today about focusing on the on life not on the mind's commentary on life i talked about how there is a voice inside us which we need to manage so sometimes having a voice speaking inside us can be seen as a sign of a mental health disorder but at a normal level we all have this voice so and this voice sometimes misreads reality like when i was speaking in public i was speaking too fast and and the mind said in order to catch attention speak even faster so in this way the mind it's a, it dis- misreads reality so what exactly is the mind i talked about this body mind soul like the hardware software and user this this a software keeps giving a pop ups usually they come as visual but sometimes they come as audio also so like that the mind keeps giving us audio and visual notifications and if we start paying attention to it we get carried away by it so the notification might just be one simple thing but the mind interprets it use a spin to it and what spin the mind will give for whom it's unpredictable say 
if one person doesn't speak nicely to us, my see people don't care for you. And then it just goes on and on. So much so that somebody not responding to a phone call can make a person want to commit suicide. So this voice inside us can not only hurt us, it can kill us. And why is this voice inside us uh, so uh, malevolent? Actually, that voice inside us is simply the programming that we have. Just like a software keeps giving us certain promptings based on whatever we have seen earlier. Similarly, the mind keeps giving us these voices. So it's, it's just it's basically like a software which having multiple voices in it is not a problem. It's like we have foreground awareness of what we want to do and we also have background awareness. So we need both this foreground and background awareness for effective functioning in the world. Like while driving, we focus on the road inside, but we have to look at the big picture also. But the mind's voice sometimes distorts our sense of perspective. That means that which should be in the background, suddenly that comes in the foreground. And then uh, so the normal functioning of the mind becomes distorted. So uh, say when we are chanting, we are at the, if, the, if at the physical level, we don't require immediate attention when the mental level becomes very strong. It's like while driving, if we don't have anything to focus on, the mind starts wandering and we wander with it. So during chanting, because we feel the physical doesn't require much attention, there's no consequence of not paying attention, the mind seems to wander more and more. And the mind can act not only as a interpreter of reality, but also as a distorter of reality. And if we are agitated, we may go through beautiful scenery, but we don't see the scenery at all. Because the mind is just like acting like a filter. So a player who is playing a match, but the commentator starts giving the opposite spin. Then the player will become disheartened. Similarly, we are going through our life. In our life, we are the players, the mind is the commentator. And the mind can just make us completely disheartened. Even when we have the ability to do things. Even when things are good, the mind can make us feel that they are bad. So the mind is the voice inside us and we can't just silence this voice but we need to manage it and managing it is because three aspects to it first is identify it and we just understand okay this voice is inside me it is not me it's someone different from me and i have to evaluate it sometimes it may give good suggestions most of the time it gives bad suggestions so i have to evaluate so first first step is identify second is engagement Krishna says, become an observer of your consciousness, see what emotions are coming inside it. And then engagement, he says, be fixed in devotional service to me. When we do that, then we start seeing that uh, these, the more attention we pay to the mind, the voice becomes bigger. The less attention we pay, the voice becomes smaller. Just like a child whose antics are not paid attention to, the child becomes silent. So, and lastly, we hear a better voice. We access higher knowledge. And by this, not only does the, uh, not only does, do we understand reality better, but also the mind also understands it better and it stops misinterpreting it. So by, um, by intelligence identifying the mind, by keeping engaged as, as an engaged purposefully, and by regularly hearing the voice of scripture till it becomes internalized within us, that is the way by which we can manage the in disturbing inner voices. And this three-part solution, I'll elaborate more with examples in tomorrow's class. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Mother. Uh, what about super soul? Does super soul intervene in the mind? Like, uh, when the mind is so, so loud? Okay, yes. It's a good question. When the mind is so loud, <laughs> does the super soul intervene? Yes, the super soul is always there with us. At the same time, the super soul has given all of us free will. So depending on whether we in the past by our actions have shown the super soul, I want to hear you or I don't want to hear you. So if repeatedly we are told, I don't know, I'm not interested in hearing you, then the super soul voice becomes mute. It is not that super soul doesn't want to help us, but the super soul doesn't interfere with our free will. So if we are regularly hearing Krishna, say the super soul can speak inside us, but the super soul can also speak through Guru Sadhu Shastra externally. Mm. The super, same super soul is uh, manifesting when we chant the holy names. Mm. So when we are doing our uh, devotional activity nicely, 
and are trying to connect with Krishna, or at least showing Krishna that we want to connect with him, then those actions will lead to when the mind starts speaking something, the super soul will speak and we will be able to hear it. So there's this beautiful explanation of Mattah Smutir Gyana Mapohanamcha. 15.15 Krishna says, I give remembrance, knowledge and forgetfulness. So now when does, uh, about what does Krishna give remembrance and what does he give forgetfulness? Mm. That depends on our desires. If my, des if my driving desire in life is to serve Krishna, but sometimes mundane desires, anti-devotional desires start coming up. So when those desires come up, if I am determined to, if I am steadily serving Krishna, then over a period of time, Krishna will give remem me remembrance of the joy of Krishna consciousness. And he will give me, that smriti will be of remembrance of the joy of Krishna consciousness. And the vismriti, apohana, the forgetfulness will be of the pleasure of material life. So when that happens, then this voice becomes completely disempowered. It's like some people, they're speaking and they have lost their voice. So their lips are moving but no sound is coming. So when Krishna does his magic inside us, the mind may speak but no voice comes out of it. So, so that, is, that, is, uh, that is a state when we are liberated from this troubling voice inside us. So that, uh, when we consistently practice bhakti, Krishna does that. But if we are only intermittently and half-heartedly practicing bhakti and we also want to do worldly things a lot then we may hear scripture a lot but when the temptation, we hear also scripture sometimes but when the temptation comes at that time seeing our desire Krishna reciprocates and he reciprocates what does he do? he gives us forgetfulness of the voice of scripture and he gives us remembrance of the pleasures of the world so Krishna basically reciprocates with our desire. So it is very difficult for us to always be Krishna conscious when the mind starts screaming. But what we can do is, in the intervening period, whenever the mind is not distracting us, that time we can try to practice bhakti as seriously as we can. So if during those times we show Krishna, I want to hear you, I want to be conscious of you, then at other times, when the mind's voice is making consciousness of him impossible, at that time Krishna will see our what is our majority desire and he will reciprocate accordingly. It may happen immediately, it may, it may happen after some time. So the super soul's voice is there, but the super soul will interrupt the mind's voice only if we have shown him that we want it to be interrupted. But if we have repeatedly shown that I don't, I'm not, I, this is what I want to do and I don't care who says what, then the super soul will, okay, a hands off approach. So the instruction of spiritual master will get you off your mind? Yes, that's the instruction of the spiritual master get us off the mind? Yes, definitely. It's vital for us. Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chitte Te Kori Aikya, as we say in the Guru Puja. So the more we hear the instruction of the spiritual master, the more uh, not only do we get guided properly, but over a period of time our mind also gets guided properly. So in the instruction of the spiritual master is life saving. At the same time, the instruction of the spiritual master is not just one thing. Sometimes some devotees say, oh, my spiritual master has told me to preach or my spiritual master told me to distribute books. That's true. But ultimately, the spiritual master's instruction is that become conscious of Krishna. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada was asked, what pleases you the most? He says, if you love Krishna, that pleases me the most. So in that sense, some of us may feel, oh, I don't have any instruction from the spiritual master. How, how can I? No, but there are many standing instructions that are already given. And to the extent we, see, the soul by nature is subordinate always. If the soul doesn't obey Guru and Krishna, the soul will have to obey the mind. But the more we start obeying Guru and Krishna, more we start taking their words seriously, the more the mind's voice will become lesser. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. You, 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 you've given such practical, good analysis of how our mind is either helping or stopping our progress. Uh, like Krishna says in the Gita, from one who has conquered his mind, uh, liberation is already open. Eh? Yes. Like, yeah, right it is already reached. It is already reached. Yeah. But yet, uh, it's just like by our karma, we get a certain type of body. Good things, not so good things. And it's just like by our karma, we get a certain quality of mind. 
Uh, and we can see some devotees, uh, they are naturally uh, attracted to Krishna and they have no problem, you know, with their minds. Well, very minimal problem, you know. Mm. And they go and they get a deeper taste very quickly. And other devotees, after decades, they're still, you know, having distractions or, or fall downs or problems. So we have the, the mind that we deserve by our past karma. But it seems that Krishna's name is Hari, which means he takes away all the bad things in our minds and whatever externally and internally Krishna is making mm. good things for his devotees. Eh? So Krishna is certainly improving our minds and helping us uh, develop buddhi, like proper discrimination and like that. You, like, perhaps yeah. we'll be able to discuss that tomorrow. Yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 thank you for the comment. I'll just quickly. Yes, sometimes some people seem to have a mind which, uh, which doesn't distract them at all or very little. Yeah. And some people's mind troubles them a lot. Yeah. Yes, all our minds have some conditionings. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that sooner or later everybody is troubled by their minds. Mm -hmm. It may just be that people who are in the mode of goodness, mm -hmm. uh, the troubles may not be that easily visible. Those who are in the mode of passion and ignorance, the troubles are more easily visible. Yeah. Say for example, somebody is in goodness, mm -hmm. uh, the mind can make them proud of their goodness. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is also, that ego is also a problem that comes because of the mind ultimately. Or okay. uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes having an undisturbed mind can make one complacent and can make one feel that I don't need Krishna. So, I have one of my uncles, he has to tell me, you know, yes, I believe God exists. He's happy there, I'm happy here. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, it's that one of the tricks of the mind also is that it makes us feel that our mind, no, that, that is also possible, but the other is that it may also make us feel, oh, you know, Others don't have as much problems as I have. Oh, and you know, yeah, self pity you could say. And even with respect to the mind, you know, my mind troubles much more than others' minds. And therefore, for others to practice bhakti is easy, for me it is difficult. And therefore, others will practice, I can't practice. <laughs> so, in that way, see, basically, the mind will find some way or the other to discourage us in bhakti. So, we may, if we start, if we start doing spiritual life, the mind will say, Sometimes we start doing our sadhana bhakti, start doing seva a lot. I say, hey, what about your family? What about your financial responsibilities? What about this? What about that? And then, okay. Then we start doing them diligently. And I say, hey, ultimately all this is temporary. Why are you spending so much time on this? Sure, you should practice bhakti. So especially students, uh, I've seen that. What happens for when we are uh, bringing Krishna bhakti to students? You know, throughout the semester, they sometimes come for programs, sometimes don't come for programs. And then, sometimes it happens for some students, just before, a few days before the exams, when they have to study intensively, they start saying, you know, actually, you know, all this, this is mundane knowledge. <laughs> 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 this is mundane knowledge. And they, they, they develop a great love for Ramayana, Mahabharata, <laughs> Lila Amrut. I just want to read that. This is spiritual. But even there, they don't want to read philosophy. They want to read some stories. Just distraction. Yeah, basically, the mind always wants to look for the path of least resistance. Okay. So, sometimes, when spiritual life appears to be the path of least res less resistance than material life, the mind says, practice spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And when spiritu spiritual life starts encountering some resistance, it says, come on, go to material life. That's so much easier. Okay. So, whichever way we go, we go from material to spiritual, from spiritual to material, he says, we ask the mind, what do you want? He says, I want you to be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> so, now whatever the mind we have, we, we can take it this way, that although this mind is troubles, troubling me, but this mind, Krishna knows, that even from this situation, Krishna can get me to him. So if our mind is undistracted, it doesn't distract us much. We can say this is this clear mind is my opportunity by which I can serve Krishna more. If my mind is distracting, then you can say the distracting mind is my opportunity to feel the need for Krishna and to urgently take shelter of Krishna. So that way, whatever be our situation, instead of feeling that others are better or I am worse, 
we can simply use we can simply take that situation as an impetus for intensifying our bhakti thank you yes sir uh, what about uh, two things intuition and faith so when we have a feeling about something is, is that a voice in our head or is that also okay. from the mind and then when it comes to faith is that something beyond the mind is it from the heart because the faith the bhakti that we have is helping us to kind of transcend okay the mind. yeah good questions so if we talk about the voice in the head is coming from the mind then what about intuition and faith mm. as i said the mind is not always our enemy the mind has impressions within us within it and broadly speaking the impressions can be of two kinds that again terms may vary but i'll just use terms as handles to talk about concepts you can say there are there are instincts and there are impulses mm. so impulses are those which are anti intelligent we impulsively shout at someone we impulsively do this or do that so impulses prompt us to act without due intelligence whereas instincts are like programmed intelligence so some people just you bring them to a new house and they intuitively say you know okay you move the sofa here you put a curtain of this color over here you paint it this way this house will look very beautiful some other people come and they look at the house for days they stay in the house they can't figure out now how to make it look better sometimes uh, so they have you could say that uh, home home design instinct they have that is a gift from nature so some people you know if you, with respect to somebody the vaishya mentality then you give them money tak 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 they count 100 notes in few few seconds they count it somebody maybe is a brahmana they counting the notes flow off they don't they just can't do it <laughs> so basically by our past impressions we are good at some things and we just get it at that time so some people they are good at language they just look at one essay you rewrite like this is start over here change the sentence like this use this word and this say if somebody is making a poster somebody spends one hour trying to get good words for the poster and somebody is in 5 minutes makes it brilliant so we all have these instincts so uh, so these are like programmed intelligence so, so now uh, it's very difficult for us to know which voice is coming from where what we can look at is rather than the source the destination where does this voice take me so if this voice is helping me to do things in a better way then that's good if this voice is making things worse for me then it is bad so sometimes some people are driving they just get an instinct okay this person is driving in a crazy way i think he may be drunk let me move aside and actually that person just wears off the course so that's a voice inside us said that whether it is a super soul's voice or our own instinct we don't have to bother about that it's very difficult as i said to know the source but as we go through our life we can ourselves by by some self observation understand that you know, these these are th things we get quickly and i get it right so then we can use that so our you know, our intuition uh, intuition can be just our own instincts as a programmed intelligence or our intuition can be the voice of the super soul guiding us specifically so both are fine but so ra we, rather than categorizing which is which we focus on whether it is taking us in a positive direction then we accept it we hear we heed it and as far as faith is concerned faith is a different ball game faith basically means that even when things seem negative right now things will be positive faith can have many different meanings one is that if i keep serving krishna everything will work out right in the future so even if bad things are happening krishna will bring good out of the bad so that faith is basically related with uh, with uh, the understanding the mind is giving a particular spin to reality but our faith helps us see things in a positive hopeful optimistic light so the faith is something which we uh, some of us have from our past life some of us have to cultivate so the more we practice bhakti our faith becomes stronger and when the faith becomes stronger then even when bad things are happening even when the mind is giving a bad spin to those things 
our faith will keep us looking for the silver lining will keep us moving forwards with po with positivity shri prabhupad faced so many reversals you know he tried to spread krishna bhakti in india his bhagavad gita commentary was stolen and sold off as garbage his bohis he tried to distribute back to god and a cow came and hit him and knocked him down he tried to build a league start a league of devotees and he was practically kicked out of there by a clique of people he tried to work with his god brothers but they had a constructed vision and they would not let him do any much so time after time after time he has got he got so much discouragement but his faith was that this is what my spiritual wants so wants me to do let me do it and with that faith he persevered so faith is something which is a very vital asset that means even when everything around us seems dark faith is what keeps our eyes looking for the glimmer of light in the distance and that's what keeps us moving इंटेलिजेंस See, different metaphors have different purposes. So, consider, for example, the so the body, a car metaphor. In the body is a car metaphor. The soul is considered to be the driver. Hmm? So here, the purpose of this metaphor is simply to illustrate that there is something beyond the physical level of reality. Hmm? Now, if you go to the chariot body metaphor. in that the soul becomes the passenger not the driver the driver is the intelligence the chariot body metaphor is not meant to just talk about how there is a soul beyond the body chariot body metaphor's purpose is to talk about how the soul interacts with the body its focus is to illustrate uh, the mechanism by which the soul and the body interact with each other so within so you could say at the level of the software and the interface there is both the mind and the intelligence mm -hmm. now <clears throat> the metaphor which i used of the hardware the software and the user this is just a contemporary metaphor which relates with our experience much more how many of us regularly go in a chariot and use a chariot here uh, very rarely is it so this is something which you easily relate with now in the software itself so there are if you see the body is physical reality the mind is subtle reality and the soul is spiritual reality so just like the hardware is something physically tangible the software is not physically tangible but still it's real but the user is a different category of existence so the word mind is sometimes used generically to refer to the whole subtle level of reality so matter mind and consciousness so in this case the mind refers to the subtle level of reality the difference between the mind intelligence and ego it is more functional than structural that means the if you consider earth water fire air they are made of different nature itself but the mind intelligence and ego all three are subtle so it's consider if i'm using a computer i have a operating system then i have some <coughs> program that i have installed and maybe there is some virus which is infected in my computer now all three are software but the way they act is different the operating system create the basic system interface my special by particular program that are there the user install programs they customize the software for particular purpose that we want and the viruses work in a negative way so similarly you could say the 
the if so now in this case from a structural point of view there's no difference between these various softwares it's from a functional point of view so similarly in the mind intelligence and ego we could say the ego is like the basic operating system it's a rough analogy the intelligence is like the program that we have installed for doing what we want to do but all the other unwanted program that are installed with the virus what happened is it on yeah. 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 the hari krishna is it on yeah. okay now the viruses are like the mind so now again as i said krishna also says the mind can be our friend so it's not that krishna uses all of these at the same time that means in the third chapter when krishna is talking about um uh, the hierarchy inside us he talks about indriyani paranya hur indriyebhya paramana manasastu parabuddhe yo buddhe paratastu sa it's about the body the senses about the senses is the mind about the mind is the intelligence about the intelligence the soul proper he doesn't here he doesn't talk about the ego why because in this particular analysis that is not relevant talking about how the mind and senses distort us and the intelligence we can use to control it so each metaphor has its particular purpose so when i was talking about uh, the metaphor today i was basically my focus was on understanding that there is a subtle level of reality and that subtle level of reality distorts our perception now just as when a antivirus pro- when a virus infects my computer the virus is software if i want to remove the virus i have to get an antivirus program which is also software but it is functionally different so uh, rather than saying earlier i said it's a very rough metaphor to call the mind like a virus because the mind also has positive impressions within it so we could say that the negative impressions at the subtle level they are like the virus and whatever positivity positive impressions positive instructions positive directions we get in a subtle body that is like the intelligence or that is what is like the antivirus program so from a functional perspective we can differentiate between the mind and the intelligence but for this particular of the metaphor my purpose entirely was to talk about how there is a subtle level of reality which distorts our perception and the whole talk as i said its purpose was to nourish our intelligence so who is going to identify how the mind is doing like this that is going to be the intelligence who is going to say okay this is not this important let me focus on practicing bhakti that is the intelligence who is going to say okay instead of hearing the mind hear the voice of guru that is the intelligence so it is uh, at the software level there is the corrupting software and there is also the correcting software so the we said we could broadly characterize the corrupting software of the mind and the correcting software of the intelligence but because the mind also has good things within it that's why i just use the mind generically over here to refer to the subtle level of reality but the intelligence is we could say the the part of the software that can correct the corruption within software okay thank you thank you yes right. Does anyone else have any questions we'll come back to you i'll we'll come back to you mother yes my ignorance uh, <coughs> there is a soul and there is a super soul there is a difference between the two of okay yeah okay so is the soul and a super soul is there a difference between the two yeah. yes actually see the spiritual level of reality is something which we can't directly perceive so those who are at the in, so many people who are on the spiritual path they when they intuit that there is something beyond this world this world is temporary and there is something beyond that so the primary perception of the spiritual level is that there is some reality beyond that but as we move forwards then we start to perceive okay in that reality also there there can be gradations just like say if we are walking on a road in dark the darkness blinds us hmm? but sometimes if say suddenly a vehicle comes a big truck comes with a it's high glare on then even the light blinds us so although the light illumine is normally meant to illumine but sometimes the light can also blind so there can be you could say darkness that blinds and there can be brightness also that blinds so the brightness does give light but it doesn't help us to see clearly but once our eyes get adapted to that light okay then you can say okay there's not just brightness okay there's a truck coming over here there are trees over here there's a road over here 
that variegatedness we start seeing. So for most of us, for most people on the spiritual path, when they start from the material level of reality, which is like darkness, and they come to the spiritual level, the first perception is that they are blinded by the brightness. So they understand there is a big light, but they perceive it all as one. But as one gets habituated to the spiritual reality, then one starts perceiving more clearly. And one understands that there is differentiation over there. So there is this, there, you are a soul, I am a soul, we are all individual souls. And beyond us, there is a super soul. So in the issue of there is a verse which says, My dear Lord, please remove the white curtain around you. Hiranmayena patrena satyasyapihitam mukham tattam pushana pavarunu satya dharamaya drishtaye. So at that time we understand, when, please remove this so that there's a, there's a white, there's a black darkness we could say, darkness, but there's also the brightness. So please remove this brightness so that I can discern you clearly. Hare Krishna. Yes, Okay. 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 Right. I think yes, that's a good idea. So shall we? I think I'll be talking about it tomorrow more in detail. Last question. Can comment or something? Can you make a comment on what Sri Bhakti Siddhanta said that the first thing in the morning should be to beat our mind with broomsticks a hundred times and at night a hundred times with shoes? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so what does Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur say when he mean when he says that beat the mind with a broomstick or beat the mind with a shoe so in the morning and the evening? Basically, the broomstick is an object for cleaning. And the shoe, you could say, is an object for disciplining. Hmm? So, if you see cleaning, that common metaphor you use is also cheto darpana marjanam. Bhava maha dava So, clean the consciousness. So, in the mind, there are the negative desires, the negative voices, the negative images. So, when we chant the holy names and infuse our consciousness with Krishna. So, then as the holy name comes in, it brings in positive spiritual impressions within the consciousness and the negative start going out by that. So it's the Bhagavatam gives also the example that hearing is like fresh rainwater. Uh, a pond or a river might be dirty because of much soil and sedimentation. But when rains come in, then the dirty water goes away and the water becomes clean. So, so using a broom on the mind means we drive out the negativity and bring in the positivity into the mind. And using a shoe basically means that it's more of disciplining. In any sort of training, there is some amount of education that has to be given. This is what you should do. And there is some amount of discipline as well. This is what you should not do. So that is the, the shoe represents the foot of the spiritual master. Or it represents the instructions of the spiritual master. So the spiritual master has tell us, you should not be doing this. You should be doing this. So those the so at one level, just engaging in the process of bhakti by you bringing positivity into our consciousness. And also equipping ourselves with the intelligence, of the with intelligence coming from the spiritual master, so that we know what is the right thing to do and what is not the wrong thing to do. And I not only know, but when the minds are doing the wrong thing, we learn to counter it. We learn to silence it. So shoe represents, uh, we could say, disciplining, and the broom represents cleaning. So by these, we can learn to channel our mental energy so that it helps us in our bhakti and doesn't work against our bhakti. So, thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki. Gaur Premanandi.